Did they call it that? And started? Yeah, yeah, I think that term came along. Uh, you know, and you, we, you could say that technically, I suppose. But um, we called it the People's Law Office right off the bat because everything was about the people for those of us who were really into the, the movement, yeah. you know. And um, so that meant it was the PLO, and that was a little, you know, we were a little bashful about that, but we decided we should go ahead anyway. And, um, and so, so then, it, 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 I, there, were, there were other groups like that in the country. There was one in LA, there was one in New York, there was one in San Francisco, I think there was one in Seattle for a while of lawyers, and they all related to each other through the National Lawyers Kid. And a lot of what we did was about the, the organizing for lawyers and organizing people into the guild. And um, as you know, as those first years went by, uh, and and so it was that was quickly kind of established or recognized as uh, uh, what you as something uh, uh, occupation a metier right a people's lawyer and and it was well, it was something you had to really qualify as not so much by being so good but just by what you did who you worked for who, and who you worked with and who your clients were and what you cared about and, and did you have uh, like faculty mentors or just come out of the we didn't have much that was another thing that was weird for us then because i mean i was maybe of, of the original guys and it was all guys right then that um, there were a couple guys who had been working in legal aid for a while and I'd been just kind of floating around, you know, but I, the, in, in the aftermath of the Democratic Convention, we had all these cases and I just was going to court all the time. So I got this really um, intense uh, uh, education, practical education in, in the ins and outs of going to court in Chicago, you know, and, 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 and so I was the only one that knew anything about how to do that, you know, really. the legal aid guys were, mainly they would be in their offices with people, they didn't go to court that much. But I went to court all the time, and and then I started getting other cases, and I was getting cases through the Neighborhood Commons organization, and, and, um, and you know every day I got up and went to the branch courts. So by the time this office group came together, I knew a lot about what to do, even though I didn't know, you know, my knowledge was about how to get around, you know, more than the depth of trial strategy and stuff like that. A lot of that we just learned by doing. You know, and there weren't, the, the guild, which was formed in the 30s, had really been wiped out in Chicago during the McCarthy time because it was really virulent here and the Tribune went after him and uh, they, just, scared, they drove everybody away from it or scared them off. There were like two lawyers, I think, that had been in a guild and that still identified that way, older guys that we knew, maybe three. Um, but right around that time, there was a move across the country also to revive the guild. And there were places, New York, San Francisco, and Detroit also, where it, it had stayed alive through the 50s. And so there was some help 
from them. And particularly after Fred got killed, there were, there were a lot of guild lawyers came in town during the convention. And I met them and I knew, you know, it was kind of vague. But when Fred got killed, Bill Kunstler came and guys from New York, other guys from New York, really helped us through the initial time. And, and Bill was here a lot too also because in that year was the conspiracy trial. Bill and Leonard Weingrass. <clears throat> so they were at least examples for us, you know. I mean, busy as they were, they didn't have much time to help us, but we could learn from them. I mean, just for the purposes of this tape, people who see it may not have a clear picture of the 68 Democratic Convention and what happened. How would you summarize it? Well, the, the, the summary is that there, there was <clears throat> you know, the year of 68 was unbelievably momentous. There was Tet, there was Johnson's abdication, there was McCarthy, or oh, first McCarthy won in New Hampshire, and or beat Johnson, I guess he didn't even really win. I don't remember. And then Johnson abdicated, he said he wasn't going to run again. And so then Bobby Kennedy's candidacy was, you know, it suddenly blossomed. and. And, um, and the anti-war movement really heated up and they said we're going to the convention, you know, and fight for a peace candidate and a peace platform. And it was announced to the country and then the Yippies said they were going to do the same thing and come to Chicago. And, uh, you know, I suppose around in, sometime in April, uh, uh, Mayor Daly had a press conference and he said, nobody's going to come to Chicago and take over the streets of our city, you know? And that was all the police needed to hear. So, and there was a, um, there was a peace march late in April which was allowed to take place and it went around town and then right at the end there were a lot of people kind of at the end of the march and they were just kind of milling around in the city center and the cops just jumped on them and just and said time to clear out of here and then just came in and just drove them out you know that, that was Sound like April 27th or something like that. It was a big deal. It was a scandal. It was a lot of middle-class white people protesting the war, and um, so that feeling just kind of carried over into the convention time. They were trying to get permits, and they were being mixed up with a bunch of lawyers. <laughs> negotiating with Daly's assistance about permits and the Yippies wanted a permit to sleep in the park and they, you know and there was like no dice and then they went to court and, and the Yippies wanted to go to court so I represent the Yippies and made a Me Too lawsuit and then the case was assigned to a federal judge who uh, used to be Mayor Daly's law partner. And I said, we're going to get in trouble, you know, we, let's get out of this, you know, for the yippies. And blah, blah, one thing led to another, and then it was all the day was here. And it was like a Sunday of the week before the convention, and everybody was in the park, and, and the cops just came in and threw their weight around a little bit, like a little foretaste. And then on Monday night, you know, there was a big rally, and then the cops just came through and drove everybody out of the park, you know, and tear gas and all that shit. And Tuesday there was more, and then Wednesday was the confrontation in Grand Park and on Michigan Avenue at the Hilton. And, and the police riot, that it came to be called. And, you know, it was... The whole world was watching as the slogan went, and you know, then that was it. Everything was on the map then, and the lines were drawn, and there was no peace candidate, and there was, you know, Nixon versus Humphrey, and like, who cares? And uh, uh, you know, the war 
is going to go on. Were you present uh, on the streets during the I was in Lincoln Park on Monday. I was there on Tuesday. We were also then, um, that was our neighborhood, and, and, and I was more, I was less mixed up with the protesters than I was with like a community group. I was like, well, the cops are running wild in the streets of our neighborhood. We went to meet with the police commander and protest, you know, and like upstanding citizens, family people. You know? I mean, for, for innocent people, for Oh, yeah, they beat up every day. I mean, in, in, including bystanders. You know, you couldn't watch it. And we, I remember we came out of the park one night, there were three or four couples. And, and, you know, I was, me and my wife were probably the youngest. And we were sitting on a park bench, or like a bench in a bus stop about a block from the park. And all of a sudden that car comes up and screeches to a halt and four or five guys get out and, and come for us with clubs. And we jump up and run and they're chasing us down the streets, you know. And it was, you know, it was scary. And so we were pissed. And we're yelling at the police commander. We actually had a meeting with him, another meeting. One night we went through the park with the police to make sure they were supposedly, you know, blah, blah. The park was empty then. But we left from Grant Park just when the stuff was starting to happen because we had to go up to the north side and meet the commander and talk more about what was going to happen from then on. And I remember walking over the bridge over the tracks down there and here came the National Guard coming over the other way, you know. And then, so then we were gone when all this stuff happened that night. You know, we were like home. We turned on the television and, you know. What do you think of the media representation? Well, it was a lot different than what it would be now, you know, because that was one of the things that happened was they went after the media, the cops. If, they, if you had a camera, let alone a television camera, they would chase you and beat you up and smash your camera, you know, and there were pictures of guys with camera with a great big press pass with blood pouring down his face, you know, and they got whacked in the head. So it was, it was, uh, um, it was uproarious. And then the next night, the last night, Thursday night of the convention, there was another rally in the park, and there was this big thing that we wanted to march to the amphitheater, which was out in the southwest, out to the southwest, a couple miles from downtown. And all the cops weren't going to allow it. And uh, um, Dick Gregory got on the PA and he says, We're going to march to my house. I live with such and such a partner. Peter knows this better than me because he was right there. And um, you know, there was a bunch of stuff. And then finally everybody took off down Michigan Avenue to march. <clears throat> they were really going to march to the convention. And the National Guard was came out and stopped them. And there was a confrontation at 18th in Michigan. And there was just a standoff. And then finally the guard commander, who was later a judge, that we used to go in front of all the time, not a bad guy, certainly a judge you'd rather be in front of than most. But he was the commander of the National Guard, and he gave the order, and they gassed these people, and just drove them all over. And I had come, I, I knew something was going to happen, I came in my suit, and then just went to the court. And pretty soon all the people they were busting started coming into the court. That was where I met Jeffrey Oz that night. Was, was, no, that was earlier, that was around the King stuff, but the same thing, you know. There's big trouble in the streets, so we'll go to court and help the people who get busted, you know. And we both came there at the same time, drove our cars in, parked next to each other, got up out of the car and said, oh, we were, you know. And, and we're partners, like, right, very much from there on. And so, but it was, you know, it was like, 
it was really lively. All of it. Never a dull moment at all. What is the police commander that you talked to regarding me? Clarence Brash, who was later sent to prison for grafting, bribery, and bullshit, whatever. A few years later. Was this at the second piece of the No, no, no. This was the. the Oh, that's the 18th district in Chicago Avenue. No, you're talking about, you're talking about Area 2, where the torture happened. Where was that? That's on the south side. That's, that, that was like a, a, a detective division station. That's what my ex-partner, Flint Taylor, had been working on that torture stuff for 25 years, right up until this moment. We're still doing cases, getting people out of jail who were imprisoned with false confessions that were tortured, and um, doing civil suits for wrongful imprisonment and for torture. Were those uh, imprisonments and torture comparable at all to the Congress? In a lot of ways, I mean, they weren't. They weren't. Um, <coughs> They weren't locked up in a special prison for sustained periods of time the way in Guantanamo is or the way Bagram. But a lot of the techniques we used, definitely the water stuff, water boarding, what they came to call water boarding, this that drowning and and bags on the head and um, and you know beat you with a phone book and and it's one of the one of the original cases what about a guy uh, suspected of killing two cops who was uh, handcuffed to a hot radiator he still had the marks because the king court showed the scars up and down his chest from the radiator, from the radiator. And the guy who was sort of the ringleader of the cops, Burge, was, had been in Vietnam. And he learned that technique with a field telephone where you can get the, you can crank the, you can put two wires and put them to the ears and the testicles and, and crank it slowly, crank it fast and escalate the current going through the guy's body. And they did that, and, and um, you know, there was a whole ring.